All right, so this is Alex Bourget. Do you want <laughs> So I, I think we're going to do your presentation first, and then you can talk about savoir faire Linux. Or do you want to do the other no, way around? No, let's go this way. Okay. So Alex is a repeat presenter for Montreal Python, and he is a super, super fast talker and typist. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome him to talk about SFL Vault, which is a project of his that he's been working on. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you who do not speak French, who do not understand French. Levez votre main si vous ne comprenez pas l'anglais. Okay, so for the little part of you, I'll say that in English. It might be a little bit quirky. I'm not a good English speaker, but. So, uh, SFL Vault. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have been sysadmin somewhere in your life, but imagine this. You have a company, you have a bunch of servers, and then you, you have a root password on your server. So take that root password, note it in your memory, then you might lose it at some point. But, and then you get into five, six other servers, and you start saying, well, I should store that password somewhere in case I explode or something like that. So you put that in a little file on your C drive somewhere, or home slash home slash stuff, and then you're very careful, so you encrypt that file. And then your company grows, and you have all sorts of passwords on a MySQL server, and then HTTP access and everything. And you still manage that little file because you haven't found anything else. And then you hire that stupid numbass, and he, he comes to your company, so you need to give him access to your password file. Give him the password file. And then, being a jackass, he just runs away. <laughs> And he's a bit angry, and then you have to run and change the passwords to all your servers, right? Most of the companies I, 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 we work with, where we work with have that password file, and that's how they manage things. <coughs> so at some of Linux, we do have something like that. We have a support center. We need to deal with some 500 servers. I don't know something like that. a lot of services like that. So we needed to write a tool, and that tool, SFL Vote, is an open source tool to manage passwords and credentials for all sorts of different services uh, for different customers. And we needed also the ability to connect to those servers before that asshole goes before us. Remember, remember he went away with the password file. So at some point, if he has access to the password files, he could memorize them and go the other way. So we have also written there automatic connection. OK, I'll just show you how it works. Okay. So SFL vote has three parts like that. It has a, so by the way, SFL vote is all written in Python. It has phone cryptography, and it's a client-server architecture. So you have a SFL vote server somewhere, and everyone installs clients. And so they share the common package. And we also have a Qt4 interface for those of uh, still live on Windows, things like that, or they want graphical view. Otherwise, it's a command line interface. And it provides with a library, Python library, that can script and have access to passwords. So, how do we install? Of course, you can have more uh, uh, complete uh, instructions on the website. This is a shortcut. So let's go here and uh, assume I've installed my my um, uh, out here. Yes, true. So I'm in my virtual environment. Okay, I've created that already. I'm going to install the packages. They do that very quickly, and then we're going to go in the vault and create a new configuration. We're configuring the server now. Okay, That's a pylons application. And it has a simple XMLRPC endpoint. So now we created the production.ini file. We're going to create the uh, HTTPS key here okay, with that very sweet line. So it wrote here. So we have production.ini. We have the SSL keys. <coughs> I should be doing that on two different screens, you understand? But it crashed before I started. So uh, that's going to set up the database for now in the production.ini. I simply configured a, su a simple SQL-like database, right? Okay, and it uses the host.pm here. And then we're going to serve. I'm not going to put that as a daemon. Okay, so the server is running. Once you've set up your, your vault, you'll want to create a new user, which is going to be an admin user. And that admin user will have every access encoded for itself. And you, should, you say, well, that's weird. That user has well, all, is all powerful. So you might want to take that user, print its key, 
on a paper and send that to your bank vault because that's your only uh, spare. You know, if you lose any passwords, if you explode and you don't have access to your password anymore, at least somewhere there's something that could you know restore your password. So we're going to set up that. Um, can you see that? Is it too small? Okay, and I'm going to use a special. Uh, okay, so here I just don't want to override my. Uh, so it supports multiple identities, so I can switch from one vault to the other vault if I'm um, multiple. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going. I want to uh, set up my user. So this way, I'm going to set the URL for my vault and give the username. So user setup, that means the admin has been created, it's waiting, you have maximum five or 15 minutes to set up that. We're gonna generate a new key pair that's stored locally and it's gonna be encrypted with that key passphrase I type in. So this is only local. The private key never leaves the computer. So you have two parts to crack if you want to go through. Now the vault, if I query the vault here, going through XMLRPC, the vault is empty. So let's add some content. So the, the way it's laid out is that we have customers. I'm going to add a new customer here. Well, yeah, so that's a new customer. Let's, let's look at the help here. Those are the machine, the, the, the functions that we have in the SFL vault. You can deal with customers. And then under each customer, you have one or more machines. So they're physical or virtual machines. And all these machines have services. So MySQL or SSH for that and that username. OK? Uh, that's how it's laid out. And also, you have the notion of groups and users how we refine the, the access controls. So we create a new customer with that command here. And it automatically adds to the, uh, to the history the machine add so that you can quickly add a new machine. We're going to go look at the options for machine add. So we can add, it's the only required one is the name. So you should give it the name and the customer ID. And then you can specify the IP address. That's for tracking purposes if you want to remember which machine is in case, I don't know, switch the IPs and we'll remember which is one, which is what. So uh, we'll give a name, that's going to be a my machine. Okay, the IP address is going to be local. That just has, it's just for information and location uh, in my closet. Okay, that's, that adds it to the system and then when, you, when we search, well we see the hierarchy there. Getting, uh, and it also added the service here. So look, let's look at uh, how we add some service. You need to specify the URL. That's how we'll, we'll deal with any type of information. We'll, we're going to create some special schemas like that uh, in the SSH or MySQL. And we'll have some handlers to automatically connect to those. So uh, I'm going to add a local user I created, Super Bob, okay, on my local host. And well, actually, I'm going to need to give it a group. So let's, oops. I'm going to group, I'm going to need to add a group because we'll see just after the way things are laid out. We need to have a group to encrypt things uh, so that we can um, decrypt them. Okay? We'll see that, we'll see that right after. So I'm, I'm going to add here a, a special super group. There you go. <coughs> okay, so your access to group. This time, it's sending the message to the vault to create a new um, a new PKI, so it's a private and a public key that's going to be stored in the vault for that particular group. And if you want to have access to a group, it will encrypt for me with my public key, which is on so my user's public key, which is on the server, where it encrypt the group's private key. That's how we're going to jump and have access to everything the group has been encoded with. So that's being generated on the server while we wait. Any questions up to, up to now? Um, yes. Thanks. Sorry, after. Yes? Why not using LDAP? Um, so this, you mean for authentication? We're not actually, um, there's no cryptography in LDAP. Well, not really, actually. Here you want to have those two different entities. So you're going to grab the ciphers that are going to be brought to the client. And uh, you know, we have that users to services mapping. Uh, I don't know, LDAP doesn't do a lot of what this does. Yeah. It will be an underlying store, hierarchical store of that data. Sorry? It will be an un underlying hierarchical store of that data. Yeah, we'll talk about that later on. Yes. No, I mean, ask the question afterwards. I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about it. 
Yes. My like question was, how long does it take to generate the, the key? But I have the answer now. Well, yeah, it depends, <laughs> uh, it depends uh, on several things. In entropy, if you move the, move the mouse a lot, it will depend and it will go faster or less faster. You have a, so in that, uh, OK, so we have a group here. And we want to add a new service. OK, so I'm going to grab the service. I got it here. OK. So that will add service to the machine one for uh, the URL SSH Superbug, <laughs> and then add it to the group one with some notes. And we're going to type in the password here. It's Megabob. So it's going to be taken up on the screen. And then there we go. It's inside. So now if we search for, for example, a closet Superbob, well, we'll get this one because it matches any, any place. If it matches some information from there, there, or the service itself. <coughs> okay, so just a fun demo here. We're going to see that we can fetch from the vault, bring it to the client. Everything is decrypted there, so different layers. And uh, we have the password locally. The vault is never, ever able to decrypt anything. It doesn't have enough information to do that. So someone could steal out the <coughs> server, go with the database, it would learn only your data structure, so how customers relate to the machines and services, but never a secret would be a compromise unless they also stole your your key on your machine, which is separate, encrypted with your password. And there again, we would have only access to what you had access. Okay, so let's add a little fun, and we'll add also a MySQL service. So that's the account for MySQL on my local machine. It's on machine one, that's the service the root user on group one, and it, now it's a parent. This one is the child. The parent is service one. And the password is, I'm going to change it after, don't worry, MySQL. OK, and now we have the hierarchy, whoops, search. So this is a regex you can put in. Hierarchy, you see it depends here. And if you show, for example, two, it'll show and decrypt. If you don't have access, it'll show access denied. The fun part now is to be able to connect. So I want to connect to number two, and the thing knows it depends on the first SSH login. So it'll grab the passwords, decrypt them, and then issue all the commands. <laughs> all the commands to, to log in. So it'll send the SSH command. This uses. Um, he expect so it listens to what's coming in. If you log in with shared keys, it'll detect that and say, oh, log in with pre-shared keys. And then wait for the prompt, and you can configure that on the service. What'll be the prompt there? Because we have some BSD boxes, and it don't, they don't have the same prompt. So you can store in the prompt, and that is going to be a, a check on a client side. And then when you have the shell, all of these things is kind of a recursive objects. You can have like seven SSH and then they're going to send the commands to the next one. And also a fun thing, and it was a tricky one, is we have a port forwarding for a, uh, whatever number of uh, SSH nested connections you want. So it'll kind of create some intermediate uh, port forwarding so that you have a local port to an endpoint, even through eight hops. And then, you, so that's the MySQL handler. You jump to another handler, it'll uh, notice how the password prompt is connecting to then you know when you're inside the MySQL. Also, we've implemented some sweet stuff. It's not all done. That's why I want you guys to punch in. But there's a shell. You know how you, you escape from Telnet? Huh? You have become a little key combination. Well, you can do that here. I don't remember the keys, though. <laughs> oh, there you go. So you have a fallback shell. So now you're just putting aside the SSH connection. You have a shell. And you can issue some commands like get put. So you could go, and that uses the fish protocol. It's not perfect, but still. And you could uh, go if you're back in seven hops, and then you say, oh, I want that file. Then you could do like it's port forward, the first one, you know, SSH mount, and then SSH go the other one, SSH mount, and do all sorts of you know, aw awful things. Or you could just <coughs> pull it out from there right now, or put, put it. <laughs> so uh, when we do that port forwarding uh, magic, it's also possible to span multiple SSH on the local machine, so we could have multiple shells on our local machine that are set aside, so that we could, you know, hop into the eight open connections and then back to to our shell. Right? 
Isn't it fun? Yeah. Have any questions? Okay, so, uh, yes, you. <laughs> So what do you mean multi-user? Multi like you need uh, a three-part key in order to like override the master password. So the three parties will have to authenticate the system with the full override. I don't know. I, I guess not. Well, you, can talk about me. you can talk about that a little bit later on. I'd be interested. Yes? So how many services can you, can you identify? Like you have MySQL, you have SSH. You have so those things, you can store whatever you want in a database. So it could be a super bob, comma, colon, slash, slash, whatever. On this client side, you can develop Python. Um, it uses entry points, so plugins. They'll detect those, and when you have that handler, so we have different handles. For example, SSH plus PKY. So you can put your SSH key in, in there have it decrypted in there, it's going to be stored in the vault, it's going to connect automatically also by putting that in a temporary file, using that as an identity, and you can go through also some random content or VNC logins or stuff like that. So that's up to you, and this, the vault doesn't check that. Okay? Yeah? Second question. Is there a way to have, right, so, so your client connection has to connect to the server, right? Or can decrypt right. Is there a way to have that connection to SSH? So I'm going to show you how it works a little bit, okay? Every communication has gone through HTTPS. It uses an XML at least RPC server. And then from your local here, you send a login request, and then it's going to encrypt a token with your user's public key, okay? And then you, you're the only one who has your private key, so you're going to decrypt that and send it back. And then you can go on with a little token. That's kind of a co uh, cookie, a uh, session cookie. And then your other commands is going to use that. And I'm just going to go over that, okay? I don't know if that answers the question. Raise your hand again if it doesn't. So that's how it's laid out. That's your user's computer. So just so you know, the, the red thing here, that's symmetric encryption, okay? So you need the same thing to fit in. It's my creation, it's, uh, yeah. And that's PKI. So see, that's the public key. You encrypt things. That's some encrypted things with that public key. That's the key to unlock it, okay? That's a legend. And <laughs> so you have the user's public key that's on the server in the user's table. And with that, you encrypt the group's private keys. And that pu public key is still available on the server. And with that, you encrypt an, a, uh, an, uh, um, a symmetric key that'll, that'll be used to encrypt the secret itself. OK? So you need all the chain up to be able to decrypt anything. So if you want to, that se secret service, you need to be in the group. If you're not in the group. If no one has encrypted for you the group's private key, then you're out of luck. And up to that there, you need your passphrase, which is in your head, your private key, private key, which is on the disk, and uh, you need to be a uh, part of those groups. Okay, so what does it, what does that, um, what's the effect, or what's the, I'm not sure. considerations there, you, 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 you. Okay, so what's the, the side effect of that chain is that if you remove the group's private key, you lose every cipher there. You lose every secret. So as it ensures that you don't delete anyone from the, the last one in the group, but also you have that safeguard admin user that you should put in a vault somewhere, in a physical vault. Um, so I talked about that already. Super admin flag. So yeah, with a log, with a log of uh, everything that happens, that's not fully implemented yet. We're working on that. Uh, with a log of every user addition, every uh, services you add, so, and every password you change, you can know at any cert any point in time which users had access to what. Okay, and if you remove someone's access. And then you change the passwords, you can be sure that person could not have access to that other password. So we can have a map. If the guy runs away and he's a jerk, well, you can know with certainty which service he had access through the vault, even though he might not have not, have not checked them. But those are the systems or the, the, the access that you must go and change before him. So we, we work both ways, preemptively. So we try to secure things, and we have groups to, to define uh, which um, access we give to whom. And also, we have automatic connection. If something goes wrong, you can go very quickly, change the passwords. That's it. I mean, other questions?
Yes. Uh, what's the uh, RSS and VSZ memory footprint for the XML RPC server? What do you mean? <laughs> PSC UX grab your RPC service and it'll tell me. PSC what? It's a P Pylons PS, application. PS space, like from the original terminal. PS space UX space pipe grep paster. Uh, why is it? Yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much. Other questions? <laughs> yes. Go back to your uh, previous slide. Uh, uh, I suppose there's uh, several uh, containers for the server secret, one sorry, per sorry. group. Whoa. Sorry? I suppose there's uh, several um, secret um, server secret containers per groups. Of so that's the kind of, see, you have a many to many here. So one user can be in one or many groups. Each of the services can be in one or many groups also. So you can have that little tiny group for that particular user. You have one service you have access to. Or you have that, if that's what we use, you have the support center that has all the passwords and certain groups that need to work on certain things. Um, you, uh, blah, blah. Yes, very Two last questions. So you demonstrated SSH and uh, MySQL. Yeah. What other handlers do you So we have, have MySQL, we have PostgreSQL, we have some experimental things for HTTP because you have to wrap the web page and then send in the password. It's a bit risky. And uh, we have, um, uh, yeah, we'll see that. I, I'll show you after. Mostly, this is, those are the ones you use. Uh, uh, VNC is in development also. It's on our desktop. We tried, but it's not. Yes? Is it complicated to add other ones? No, it's a simple script. And then you add what you're listening for. And then what you'll receive a, a service object which has the decrypted information. And then you, I'll show you that if you want. It's a, an object that receives and provides things. So it asks for a shell and provides some whatever thing. And it's, it's a bit, yeah, it's recursive, so you have to think about it twice, but uh, it works. <laughs> well, yes. Oh, sorry, last one. Does, does the, um, the protocol of the, by, by, by virtue of using SSL protect against man in the middle attacks when exchanging keys at the top level? When you log in, it, you sign a session token, send that back. Is there any man in the middle protection against that? We're using HTTPS here. Yeah, there is some recent issue, or not yeah. some recent issues about that, where you could inject right. stuff and take over sessions. So. Okay, so you inject it, and then we'll try to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. I'm done. Well, thank you very much.